All right. So like I said, this chapter, we're going to move into uh, chapter four, uh, which is probabilities. And so probabilities matter to us in business because, well, we want to know how likely it is that some events going to occur uh, to occur. So these are some of the concepts we would use it for in business. Um, you know, what's the chances that this will happen? What's the likelihood of something else happening? We use this a lot in sports, actually statistics as well. Not only are we saying, um, you know, what's the likelihood of us getting a kill on a given play in volleyball, but we're also um, we're also saying, you know, the, what that does is it helps us adjust where people are. I know when I did soccer as a coach, we would track where every goal that was scored was scored from on the field, right? And then we would start to adjust our plays to get the ball into that area more because we know which of our strikers or, or attackers is more likely to make the goal. All right. So probability, we have to think of in statistics as a numerical measure. And probability is always a number between zero and one. Where if, if, the, if probability is zero of something, that means it will not happen. Absolutely. Okay. And if the probability of one means 100% sure this event will occur. And anything between those uh, is, you know, five is just as likely as it, as it is unlikely, 0.5, uh, and so forth. Okay. I tend to think of them, even though they're, they're expressed in the decimal, I think of them as a percentage, right? So 0.5 would be like a 50% probability. It's just as likely to occur as not occur. 0.98 is very likely to occur. Right. All right. So how many of you have taken some type of science courses already? So you probably learned about the scientific method. So when you experiment, you have to have the idea of like a hypothesis. And then you are going to come up with some experiment to test the hypothesis, right? Control the variable. It's a little different in statistical uh, experiments. Um, and so a lot of times you'll hear it either called statistical experiments or random experiments. And the idea with a statistical experiment is that the probability determines our outcomes. So we're not talking about controlling one variable or not. We're saying based on our experience, What's the probability of the outcome happen? Okay, so it's just a little different. All right, so these are just a couple terms you should know. Experiment is something that defines outcomes, gives well-defined outcomes. Sample space is all of the possible experimental outcomes. And an experimental outcome is sometimes also called a sample point, but within the sample, the outcome was this given point. Okay. So here's some examples of the experimental outcomes or sample spaces. So if you toss a coin, the sample space would be heads or tails. What's the probability of getting heads on a coin toss? 0.5, right? Yeah, 50%. The inspection of a part is either defective or non-defective. A lot of times in business, it doesn't help us to be like, how defective is it? Like when it's coming off the assembly line, we just want to know is it effective or not effective. Sales call, we get a sale or no sale or purchase or no purchase. When we roll a die, we can get a one, two, three, four, five, or six. The probability of getting any one of those would be one out of six, which is what? Point one six, something like that. But one six 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 seven. And if we play a football game in the modern system, at least right now, we can win, lose, or tie. Unless it's a football game, then we can win, lose, or draw. Uh, but same thing. So just recognize that with a given experiment, the, the sample space is just all possible outcomes of the experiment. Okay, that's what we need to know conceptually. So here's this example we're going to use kind of throughout the rest of this presentation. Uh, this is a company called KPNL or Kentucky Power and Light. They have a project to increase their generating capacity. So they're going to, I don't know, upgrade their, their generators. So it has two stages, design stage and a construction stage. Um, and then there's possible completion items. They're not sure, but they look at it. They could possibly take two months or three months or four months in the design. In other words, there's too many variables for them to know yet. Okay. And the construction stage 
could be six, seven, or eight months, depending on some decisions they make. So there's our sample space, um, sort of. Anyway, it gives us, we'll, we'll get into the sample space more in a minute. So the first, I guess, thing you'll need to know for calculating a problem that we're called counting rules. So give an experiment, consists of a sequence of blank steps. They use K for the number of steps. There are N1 possible results for the first step, and N2 possible results for the second step, and so on. And the total experimental outcome is given by N1 times N2 onto however many there are. In this case, there's only two. So N1 times N2. So if there's three possible here, and three possible outcomes here, then the total number of outcomes in the sample space will be three times three, which is nine. We could have nine possible outcomes for how long it will take us to complete this project. Okay. So that slide is just showing you what I just told you. There's three. So N1 is three, the number of possible outcomes in the design stage. N2 is three, the number of possible outcomes in the construction stage. And so the total number of outcomes will be three times three, nine. So here's a little tree diagram of that, right? If my design step takes two months, my construction step can either take six, seven, or eight. So a two, six gives me eight total months, nine total months, 10 total months. If my design takes three, there's three possible, or if it takes four, there's three possible. So there's my nine possible outcomes. Interestingly though, there's some overlap, right? These are both nine. These are both 10, these are both 11. So we say we have a one in nine chance of being eight months, two in nine chance of being nine months, two in nine chance of being 10 months, two in nine chance of being 11 months. Oh, actually, no, it's three in nine chance of being 10 months, and a one in nine chance of being 12 months. So that's helpful to us as we start to make decisions because most likely it's not going to be eight, four, 12, right? So we could that right now. From probability just narrows it down to it's more likely it's going to be somewhere between nine and 11 months for decision making. Does that make sense? How that can be valuable to sort of start to see that? All right. So we need to um, differentiate between what are called combinations and permutations when we're doing these counting rules. So the difference between a combination is the number of experimental outcomes are selected from a set of objects, okay? This is a little confusing and you'll see examples will make it clear. So here's the formula for it, but there is an Excel function of combined or combin, C-O-M-B-I-N, okay? Which will help us with calculating these. But the formula is that you take, so this would be like, you know, if we had racers running a race, Right. And we say, what's the probability of any given racer, you know, being first, second, and third? Well, it's 100 percent. Somebody's going to be first, second, and third. But then if we say specifically that them being in this order, then we get to what are combinations of permutations. Okay. So there's our formula. That's the number of the full set. You guys know what the exclamation point means? I learned it once in like High school math, or anybody remember it? Yeah, factorial, right? So they're saying n big n factorial, which means if it was a nine, it would be nine times eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. If you had to do it in Excel, there's actually a function for it. That's a CP fact. Okay, so we take the number of objects that we're drawing from divided by the number of objects, um, the number of experimental, let's see, let's say, the number of objects that we're selecting, factorial, times the number of objects we're drawing from, minus the number of objects we're selecting, factorial. That's confusing. Don't worry too much about it. Then I want to show you that, and then we'll get into an example where it makes more sense. Okay. The other type is called a permutation. And this one is a little different than combination because with a permutation, the order of selection is important. And here's what I mean by that. 
in a race, is the order of selection important? Who's first, who's second, who's third? Do those have meaning above just three people won the race? Yeah, they do, right? First, second, and third. So that order that they come in is important. Or if I said I have a basket with green balls and red balls, and I pull out three balls, you know, how many greens, how many reds do I have? It doesn't really matter if I pull out a green ball first or a red ball first. It just is my total number of. So with combinations, order isn't important. And with permutations, order is important. And so since we have Excel functions to do the math for us, really the thing that you need to figure out when you're doing these, am I dealing with a combination or am I dealing with a permutation? Okay, that's like the key to getting through these successfully. Um, you'll see that the, the uh, formula is not much different. Here we have little n factorial times big N minus little n factorial. In this one, we just have big N minus little n factorial in, in the denomination. Again, if this were a math class, we'd get into the finer points of what that means. It's not a math class, okay? We want to think more like decision makers and just understand the basic ideas. So like I said, when we do the guided assignment on Wednesday, we're going to walk through how to do this and what it means more. I'm just trying to give you uh, an overview of the concept right now. All right, so here's some basic requirements defining probability. So the probability of this experiment, probability of experiment I, is going to be somewhere between zero and one. That's all that means, okay? That, again, that, the, the mathematical notation was scary, but all that said is what I told you earlier, the probability is going to fall somewhere between zero and one. And that's inclusive of zero and one, right? Because you're equal to under the little thing. Number two, the sum of all probabilities for an experimental outcome must equal one. So I saw a meme the other day that had uh, two books. And the one book said, everything they teach you at Harvard Business School. And the other book said, everything they don't teach you at Harvard Business School. And the meme said, these two books contain the sum of all information in the universe, right? Because if you think about it, all of the information they teach you at Harvard Business School, plus all of the information they don't teach you at Harvard Business School should mean all information, okay? And it was a statistic nerd joke. But the idea is the probability of all of the outcomes has to be one. So for flipping a coin, probability of heads, 0.5, probability of tails, 0.5. The probability of getting either a heads or a tails in a flip is one. Now I know what you're gonna say. In theory, you can line out a change. But that we would consider that not a flip, right? You have to flip it again. Tails never fails, don't forget. There's good science behind it. There's no science. All right, so when we assign probabilities, there's three different ways we do it, okay? The first is what's called the classical method. And that is assigning probabilities based on the assumption of equally likely outcomes. So with the coin toss, heads or tails, we're assuming that those two are equally likely. If you, you could get a trick coin or something, right? Or if you're picking a card out of the deck, again, you're assuming it's well shuffled and picking any one card out of the 52 would be equally likely. So that's called classical probability. The second type is called the relative frequency method. And so this we usually base on experimentation or historical data. So, you know, so what we do is we say, hey, of all the incoming students at EAC um, for the past 10 years, 54% have been female and 46% have been male. And so we're going to assume that that's going to hold true this year. Will it hold true? Probably not exactly. But if we take a big enough data set, it's going to give us a reasonable estimate, unless there's been some major change that would lead to that being different somehow. Okay. The last major change we had that massively affected, affected enrollment at EAC was when the LDS Church lowered mission ages to 18. We had like a bunch of boys who would have come here to the high school not come and still the same number of girls came <laughs> so that threw off everybody was like whoa we didn't prepare we should have had dorm rooms 
in the women, you know, we should have adjusted for that. Um, anyway, then the third is what's called the subjective method. And the subjective method um, is based on judgment. Okay, so this is like not based on math or science. Kind of like, you know, I, I go to someone who knows more about something than me, maybe someone who's an expert, and I say, hey, who's going to win this ball game today? And Braden says, 57% uh, chance it's going to be this team and a 43% chance. What's he basing that on? Well, he could be just pulling it out of his, out of the air, right? Or he could be like, no, I've watched these teams. I've seen how they played. I've seen how they played each other earlier in the season. And I have some basis based on my intuition and my knowledge of the game that one team has a slightly better chance of winning than the other, okay? Um, there's a fourth one that is in here now where we use a lot of computer modeling, right? So you'll see them, you know, in the, for the World Cup, odd makers do this, but they in essence take two teams and run a simulated game like a million times. And then the computers can do that, right? It's hard for a person to do, but a computer can do that math and then say, hey, they played a million times and this team won 672,000 out of the million and this team won and they start to base their odds on that. Think about it, if you're a, a, an odds maker, someone who does betting, you want to be as accurate as you possibly can with your forecasts so that you can set your odds so that in either case you make money, right? You want to set those just right and close in the middle. All right, so here's an example of the classical method, rolling the die, so that has n possible outcome. So the probability of any given outcome is one over n. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six are the possible outcomes in the sample space. One over six is the probability of any given role. Okay. The relative frequency method. So here's the waiting time in the x-ray department for a local hospital. They do a study and they notice that, on, that for two days during the 20 day study, zero people were waiting for five days during the study. One person was waiting, et cetera. Okay. So now they would make some estimate saying, okay, well, two out of 20. So there's about a 0.1% probability that you'll have no wait time. 25% that you'll have, that you'll be one person waiting, et cetera. Okay. So with relative frequency, we're just looking at past experience, or we might set up an experiment and observe what happens there. Same thing. Okay. So those first two are the most common that we'll be using in business, but you do have to use intuition in business too. You just have to admit some people have better intuition than other people. Anybody ever heard of Warren Buffett? He's an investor. I think that was the greatest ever. He started his own classic. Anyway, he's known for not only having good sense, about markets and like understanding the math of it, but also having good intuition. He makes good picks. He's just, he's actually uh, his company Berkshire Hathaway is a is a a major owner of Dairy Queen, and they asked him why did you buy Dairy Queen instead of buying like into the tech stuff? Because it was after the tech bubble burst. He like didn't lose very much money because he wasn't that invested in it. And he said, I only like to invest in things I understand, and I don't understand. A lot of these tech things, there's tech things I do understand, and I invest in those, but I don't understand a lot of them. But I do understand like a good hamburger and ice cream, and like I don't think people will ever stop liking them. And I, you ever like be someone that's like so commonsensical that you're like in a, in a world where everybody else is trying to speak all jargon and you're like, okay, I would like to, my goal is to someday own a share of Berkshire Hathaway stock. Unfortunately, one share is, I don't know what it's trading at today, a couple hundred thousand dollars per share. And so I don't know if I'll ever buy it. But just because it's cool. But I do own mutual funds that have Berkshire in their portfolio. So I guess technically I own some both. All right. Subjective method, like I said, this is based on subjective elements. And so usually based on expertise uh, and like this, they call it the degree of belief that an expected or external outcome will occur. Um, and then they said, this is interesting for business right here. The best probability estimates are often obtained by combining the estimates from the classical or relative frequency approach with subjective estimates. So in other words, you observe and you collect data and then you involve experts and say, okay, given this data, what do you think we should do, right? 
there's still always some element of subjectivity. Are we going to offer a class in the evening? Do we think students will come to it? Well, our data tells us for the last five years, well, they've had low enrollment, but we also know that there's been a lot more hiring at the mine, so people can work that are working day shift can't take it. You know, so we have to go through that same idea. We're going to combine data with the subjective element. Um, Tom and Judy make an offer to purchase a house. Judy thinks there's a 0 0.8 cent or 80 percent chance it will be accepted, and 20 percent chance it will be rejected. Tom thinks a little bit differently. But you can see right there, there's a consensus between them that it's more likely to be accepted than rejected. But you have to ask yourself, like, what is their what is their expertise and knowledge, right? If they're both realtors who understand the market, their subjective idea of probability would be stronger than if they're just some person who just, you know, put an offer on a house and really hopes that it gets accepted. Because that's the other thing, right? Have you ever, like, in your mind, like, Cheated the probability of something happening because you really wanted it to happen? Probably, right? We're full of all sorts of biases. Let's get it. All right. I'm going to skip on past that. All right. So now we'll talk about events as opposed to experiments. Okay. So an event is a collection of sample points, and the probability of any event is equal to the sum of the probabilities of the sample points in the event. That sounds, again, like mathematical jargon, and it's confusing. And it puts you to sleep, right? Carl? Yeah. No, I, he doesn't even know what I'm talking about. He like snapped away. No, no, no. Okay. Um, all right. So if we can identify all the sample points in the experiment and assign probability to each, then we can compute the probability of an event. So again, let's just take a look at an example rather than try to look at their jargon. So we have Kentucky Power and Light Company. And they have completion results for 40 different projects. So now instead of just saying, it could be two months and six months or two months and seven months. Now they're looking at data saying, okay, the last 40 times we did these types of projects, what was the completion time? Okay, so, so now they, they have this data. So it looks like the most likely is eight months at 20% probability. So what is, so, so now we can ask this question, what is the probability that the, the project will take 10 months or less to complete? And all we do is we use this basic rule of addition to say, there's one, two, three, four, five, six um, outcomes. So the probability of those is just the probability of each of these independent outcomes all added up. So if we go back and look at this, and they said, what was it, 10 or fewer months? I could just look at, well, it doesn't have it broken down, but each one that is 10 months or fewer, and just add up their probabilities, and that would give me the probability of it being 10 or fewer months. Okay, so it's additive, which means the math isn't creating hard in this case. So they're saying, based on their experience on their last 40 projects, there's a 70% chance this project will be done in 10 months or less. Again, that can help with decision making, and that's the intent of all of this, more so than us becoming statistical math experts. Right? If you're the CEO, you've got people. Even if you have a small company, you can usually hire a firm that can do a lot of the math for you. Um, all right, event L, the project takes 10 less, will take less than 10 months to complete. So in that one, we would not include the ones that took 10 months, right? Less than 10. That's another thing in this chapter that gets easily throw you off on the homework is noticing when it says 10 or less or less than 10. Okay, because one includes 10 and the other one doesn't. So you have to sort of watch for that. Um, so the probability that it's less than 10 months is 40%. So if you're the boss and you're like, oh, 10 or less, 70%, I feel good about that. But less than 10, 40%, I don't want to make any real big guesses based on that. All right, so here's some basic relationships of probability. And so I'll go through what each of them mean in a minute. But we have the complement of events, the union of two events, the intersection of two events, and then mutually exclusive events. You probably have heard of mutually exclusive before, right? 
when we have mutually exclusive things, that means if one happens, the other can't. So but that's that's probably the easiest one on there. But so let's talk about the complement. So the complement of event A is defined to be the event consisting of all sample points that are not A. So to find the complement of something, again, you probably learned this in high school math, it's just one minus the probability of A is the complement of A. Okay, because if we have the probability of A, then the probability of AC, which is the complement of A, is just remember the whole sample space adds up to one. So we take the probability of A, one minus the probability of A would give us the probability of the complement of A or all other potential outcomes that aren't A. Or the way they show it there, the probability of A plus the probability of the complement of A is equal to one. Okay. So the union of two events, so here we have the union of event A and B is the event containing all sample points that are in A or B or both. So in this case, we have event A and event B overlap. So we have the probability of that, probability of that, including the overlap. It's denoted by A, it's this weird U symbol, right? It's not actually a U, but it looks not like a U that I remember it, union, by that thing that looks like a U between the two. So that would be saying, what's the probability of so this whole box represents the sample space? What's the probability of, of all of A and B? The issue with this is if you take the probability of A and add the probability of B, you'll be double counting this overlap. So we have to know that this overlap is called the intersection of A and B. Sometimes we'll be asked, what's the probability of the intersection? Um, and the intersection is denoted by the upside down U. All right, so they call this the addition law, but it's just telling us that the probability of the union of B is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of the intersection. And the reason we have to subtract the intersection is so that we double count it, right? So we take the probability of A plus the probability of B. Since we've now counted that twice, we subtract the probability of the union. And that gives us the probability of the, I'm oh, sorry, we subtract the probability of the uh, intersection. And that gives us the probability of the union. So the probability of the union of B is equal to the probability of A plus B minus the intersection. Okay. And since that is just a basic algebraic equation with pluses and minuses, you could probably see how you can calculate the intersection as well, right? You would just have to be like, isolate that. All right. So here we have a small assembly plant with 50 employees carrying out performance evaluations. Each worker is expected to complete work assignments on time in such a way that the assembled product will pass final inspection. Here's the result. So five of our employees were late. Six of our employees did defective. And two of our employees did work late and defective. Wow, that's All right. So we can see that that doesn't add up to one, right? So we can see that it doesn't have it on here, but probably the other one, the biggest one actually, is that they did it correctly and on top. So this is showing the negative. So, all right, so the event L is the event that work is completed late. And the event D is the event that is defective. So if we want to assign our ratings based on that, we can say the probability that it's late and effective. We can do the probability that it's late plus the probability that it's effective minus the probability of the intersection of those two. So 18% of people in there are late and effective. 
that I mentioned mutually exclusive events, and that is they have no sample points in common. There's no overlap. Okay. So if B happens, then A can't happen. If A happens, then B can't happen because there's no overlap. Whereas when there's overlap, A and B can happen simultaneously. So if they're mutually exclusive, the probability of A and the intersect of A and B is zero because there is no intersect. Okay. All right. I told you, I apologize in advance. There's a lot of slides because there's just a lot of concepts in here. And in this session, I just want to cover those concepts and then we can move into working with them. Okay. Um, so conditional probability is the probability of a given event of an event given that another event happens. Okay. And so it's written with this, this little straight line means given. So this would be what is the probability of A given B occurring? Okay. And this I'll show you when we do some examples, pivot tables of it. Pivot tables make it so easy to do this kind of work. Here's the formula. The probability of A given B is the probability of A with the intersect of A and B divided by the probability of B. Again, for our math class, we get into more proofs. I don't think it's necessary for this class. Uh, we just want to learn the concept and then we'll move on. So here, they've done this in a pivot table. Here's our promotion status of police officers over the past two years. So if we want to say, what's the probability that a man was promoted? So what we're saying is, given that it was a man that we're looking at, what's the problem they were promoted? So we would look at just men, and we would say 288 out of 960. I'm oh, sorry, no. Or we say if they were promoted, what's the probability of given they were promoted, they were a man? Then we would say 288 out of 324. Okay. So given just means we're limiting our data set to a smaller subset of the overall data. The probability of A given B means the probability that we get an A if we're only looking at B, which I think is more confusing than helpful. So let's look at this. So the promotion status of police officers in the past two years, we can create a probability table. And now we can see men were 80% of the promotion and women were 20% of the promotion. We can see this represents all possible promotions. We can see that of the men, 24% were promoted and 56% were not promoted out of eight, uh, out of 0.8 total and so forth. So this is called a probability table that just breaks down instead of pure numbers, it just does the probabilities of each one happening out of the total. And then this is called a joint probability table. And this tells us so let's see how that's 288 out of 1200. So it just breaks down. How is that different? What do they do differently? They do exactly the same thing. So we'll talk about it more when we come out. I dare to say I pulled a bad one because they didn't show the difference. All right, so here's their conditional probability problem. So the promotion status of police officers over the past two years. Event A is that an officer is promoted. Event M is that the promoted officer is a man. So we're going to say it's the probability of A given M. If we were going to do this mathematically, we would say the probability of the intersect of A and M, 0.24. Probability of it being a man, 0.8. So the probability of A given N then is 0.24 divided by 0.8 or 0.3. There's also a multiplication law that helps us find ways, which is the probability of the intersect of A and B, the probability of B times the probability of A given B. Again, don't worry too much about the formulas for now. I will show you how you can sell and we can do more on thinking about what it means. So here we have a newspaper circulation department. Event D, household subscribe to the daily edition. Event S, the household already holds the subscription to the Sunday edition. 
So again, if we want to find the probability. The household will subscribe to both the Sunday and the daily editions. We think probability of daily times the probability of S given D, and that tells us 63%. Okay. Again, not scary to sound. We also have independent events. So the probability of event A is not changed by the existence of event B. We would say the two, ten, two, two events are independent. Okay. So the probability of A given B equals probability A, or the probability of B given A equals probability of B, we would say these are independent. Okay. This is not the same as mutually exclusive. In fact, it probably says that somewhere here. Mutually exclusive means that one happens, the other can't. Independent means that one happens, it doesn't affect the outcome of the other. Okay. So again, there's multiplication law for independent events. And here's our example, the use of a credit card to purchase gasoline. Past experience, we know that 80% of customers use credit cards for the purchase of gasoline. The service station manager wants to determine the probability that the next two customers purchasing gasoline will each use a credit card, okay? So event A is the first person using a credit card. Event B is the second person using a credit card. Before we even do the math on this, we could tell these are independent events, right? It's not like if somebody uses a credit card, it's more likely that the next person will use a credit card. Like that's just, you can, this is kind of common sense. It's kind of like flipping a coin. The outcome of the first flip just has no bearing on the outcome of the second flip. Okay, so those are independent events. Whereas if I have a thing full of balls, red and green, and I pull out a red one and set it aside, now the next one I pull out, there's going to be one fewer red one to choose from. So those are dependent on each other. The outcome of the first event impacted the outcome of the second event. And honestly, understanding that concept is more important than the math for us, even though we'll do some math. Okay. That events can be independent, meaning the outcome of one does not impact the, impact the other. And they can be dependent, meaning the outcome of one does impact the other. All right. So to figure this out, if it's independent, we say the probability of the intersection of A and B, the probability of A times the probability of B are 0.64. All right, that's what I just said. Mutual exclusiveness and independence are two different things. Don't it's easy to get them confused. So just a warning again. I'm going to introduce the idea of Bayes' theorem, but we're not going to do much with it. Okay. Just that with Bayes' theorem, so most in a lot of probability analysis, we start with what's called prior probabilities. In other words, probabilities that we have seen in the past, and now we're applying them forward. Okay. Um, and Bayes' theorem allows us to, to kind of do it backwards. In essence, so what we don't normally do is we take higher probabilities and then we calculate what's called a posterior probability or what we think is going to happen in the future. Um, Bayes' theorem lets us revise the prior probability. So in other words, we can actually take our, well, let's just look at it. So a manufacturing firm receives shipment of parts from two different suppliers. And the quality of the purchase parts varies from the source of supply. So event A is parts from supplier one. A2 is the supplier two. So from our past experience, the probability of one is 0.65 and two is 0.35. So based on that historical data, we also find that from the supplier one, gives us 90% good parts and supplier two gives us 95% good parts. So what's the probability that it's good if it's from A1? 0.98. It's good from A2.95, bad from A1. Okay, that's just telling us what we already knew. The Bayes theorem. Again, we can make a C diagram of it. 6535, that shows the probability of from that given supplier. Then step two is the probability of it's good or bad. And then there's four total outcomes. So to find the posterior probability event A will occur because event B has occurred, we apply Bayes' theorem. It's this big mathematical thing. Like I said, we're not going to do much with it. 
but it just helps us find another way of getting future probabilities from uh, past uh, examples. So again, sort of just be like, there's a thing called base theorem that allows us to do this. I don't think we need to work on it more than that for the role of recovery in this class. So that's it. Um, I, I debated on just leaving base theorem off, but you may hear of it later, and I want you to have at least heard of it and kind of know what it means more than being able to work it, if that makes any sense. Um, all right, so that's it for today. On Wednesday, we will actually do some problems, and I think it will all become a lot, clear, a lot clearer then, okay? So have a great day, and I, I'm sorry again for the volume of slides, but there's just a lot of information to cover in this chapter.